What if I tell you, you don't really need to watch this video if you know our efficient solution to the problem. The problem statement is, consider you have a file which is really large file, it could be in GBs or terabytes, and you need to copy this file into different servers or clients efficiently. And the first real problem statement is, you need to make sure that this file is intact. That means that this file is not corrupted. Also means that the copies in the server and the downloaded place should be same. If in case the files are corrupted, which most likely happens, you need to efficiently fix that file without downloading the entire file over the network. Since these servers are, um, you know, connected by internet, it is really important that we should consume as much as less bandwidth when we are correcting the file. So how do you solve this? And the solution should be in logarithmic time or log in time. So if you know a solution to this problem, you don't really need to watch this video, go watch something else interesting. Otherwise, we're gonna discuss some interesting data structure called as Merkle tree. Using that, we can actually solve all of this problem. A lot of interesting distributed systems actually use this Merkle tree. For example, peer-to-peer -peer network like Torrents actually uses Merkle tree to fix all of this problem. And also Dropbox-like solutions also can use Merkle tree. Cassandra actually uses a tool called as Anti-Entropy Repair Tool in which Merkle tree is actually is used to fix the replicas which were out of sync from the actual uh, data. And also blockchain uses um, Merkle tree to verify the transaction instead of downloading the entire data in the blockchain by just downloading the metadata which block, uh, the Merkle tree actually provides. Now let's understand this problem a little bit in depth and jump to Merkle trees. Say for example, you have client one, client two, and client three. So let's, the system is a Dropbox. So as soon as you put a file over here, the file will be synced to server and from server, the files are replicated to other two clients. So consider this file is 10 GB worth of file. Um, and as soon as you create this file in the client one, the client will basically upload that file to server here and it gets 10 GB of file, and then these files are actually synced to uh, client two and client three. So this file is present everywhere. Most likely every time the copy or download and uploading process works, but there are often times that the files get corrupted when uploading or downloading. That's where all of the solution or whatever we are going to dis discuss today is all about. So you might be asking, okay, the download and upload always works seamlessly in why the data gets corrupted. It's not like what you think. The data actually gets corrupted when you are downloading an upload, but a lot of uh, underlying APIs which actually corrects themselves, you don't even notice that. But let's not worry about that. Consider that the files can get corrupted. Then how the file can get corrupted? There are two ways it can happen. The first one is either the problem with the software, hardware, or network. And if any one of these have a trouble, then most likely the files get corrupted. And the second way is most probably intentionally someone is modified or unintentionally also can someone can be modifying. While you are writing um, this file on a client one, someone else might be modifying this file as well or viruses or malwares can be modifying this file as well. You never know. So either intentionally or unintentionally, there are chances that the files can get corrupted. So that's when we need to apply some of the um, algorithms and then try to fix these problems in the files efficiently. Let's consider you have this file and you download it over here and everything is fine, right? How do you actually verify using a you know, simple solution? The simple solution is character by character matching. If we had these two files on the same machine, then it would have been easier. But since these two files are apart and basically they are in different machines and they are connected via network, it's not going to be possible. So the other simple solution is hashing. So what you can do is hash of this entire file in the server and also calculate a hash of this file in the client and you get a hash, say for example hash AB and you get hash here as well AB. So you basically match this hashes in the server and the client you will actually know the file is intact or not. This is a very simple solution. But what if the file over here is corrupted? Well, only one bit of the file is corrupted. Then also we don't get the same hash in, the, in here. Say for example, if this file is corrupted, then we might get this hash as A1, but in the server, the hash is AB, they won't match. 
So what you have to do in this case of simple hashing method, you will have to download the entire file because you don't know exactly where the file is corrupted. That's when actually Merkle tree will rescue you. Let's understand Merkle tree and how to build it and what is Merkle tree. And then we will actually discuss how we can solve this problem. So what is Merkle tree? Merkle tree is a tree like data structure, which exactly looks like binary tree, but there are different variant of Merkle tree where you can have non-binary tree like structure as well, but let's not worry about it. So Merkle tree is a tree like data structure, which looks like binary tree in which each node actually contains the hash values. Usually we build Merkle tree by bottom up approach. That means that we basically compute the leaf node first and then we go to the top. And then um, let's understand how we actually build Merkle tree. Um, so the very first step in building Merkle tree is you need a file and we need to break this file into different chunks. The size of the chunks remains constant because we need the size to be constant always to build the Merkle tree and recreate the Merkle tree on this other client side or server side. So we always keep uh, chunk size as a constant. Um, the, the smaller the chunk, you will actually have more data in the Merkle tree. The bigger the chunk, you will have less data in Merkle tree, but you need to find the fine balance between um, the Merkle tree data and the file chunk size. Um, so it's, it's, it's out of the topic for now. So let's consider this file has, we'll break this file into four different chunks. So we call it as chunk one, two, three and four. So each chunk is actually having a equal size. So say basically one MB, one MB, one MB and whatever the rest, okay? So let it be. So now what we have to do is, we have to take a hash function, always use the same hash function, hash of this particular chunk, whatever value you will get, you will have to have as a first level of leaf nodes. So hash of this value always gives a you know equal length hashes no matter what is the input size. So for the example, for the sake of example, let's take a different notation just to make it the representation easier. So hash of chunk one actually gives A as a hash, hash of chunk two gives B, hash of chunk three gives C, and similarly for D, uh, for it's D. So now what we have to do, the next step is we need to add these two hashes. It is a string, right? You just need to concatenate these strings. And again, that data goes into the hash function and it gives out a new hash. So basically, this value here, so these are the leaf nodes, okay? Now we need to calculate uh, from the bottom upper approach, right? So from the leaf, leaf nodes, we have to calculate the parent node of them. So what we have to do is, we have to combine A plus B, and when you hash that A plus B, you will get a new hash. Let's consider that hash is AB, okay? And similarly, when we do here, hash of C plus D will give us to CD. And similarly, we keep doing the same thing. So now AB plus CD, hash of AB plus CD will actually give us ABCD. So now we have a Merkle tree in which each node actually contains the hash values and the leaf nodes or the last level of the tree actually is linked to the chunks of the file itself, okay? So now this node is called as root hash, okay? Let's call it this as root hash, okay? And this is all the Merkle tree is all about. And let's save this whole Merkle tree in our server side, okay? Now we have pre-computed Merkle tree for this uh, file. Now what do we do? We copy this file to the client so we copy it over here, okay? Now, if this file is intact or not, how do we verify it? And also we need to verify which part of the file is corrupted and we also try to, uh, you know, re-download only that chunk instead of downloading the whole file. That's what makes this whole process efficient and which is uh, logarithmic of n or log n. So what do we have to do is, We'll have to rebuild the Merkle tree on the client side as well, okay? We have this whole information on the server side. Let's build tree for this same file on the client side. So if you know, we will have a predefined chunk size. So when we break this file as well, if this file is intact, then we get the same size of chunks in the same order. So we will definitely have, so let's take a happy scenario in which the file is downloaded properly. That means that they are similar. 
So we will get a chunk, same chunk, right? Two, three, and four. So same chunks. When you apply hash, the same hash function on this chunk, we basically get the same hash, that is A. And here we get B, C, and D. And we keep doing it, so we build Merkle tree. We actually get the same Merkle tree, just like how we have in server. So now, once we build this, we basically have a root hash on the client side, and we send back root hash of the Merkle tree to the server. In the server side, we already have you know calculated the Merkle tree, so we have the root hash. Let's compare the root hash from the client and the server side. So ABCD and the what from the client side, what we got was ABCD. So both are same. So everything is good. So we don't need to re-download the file or re-correct the file, and everything is good. Suppose if the file was corrupted, what would happen? Maybe a last, uh, you know, a line in the file or last piece of the file, even if one bit is corrupted, uh, that means that the actual file is corrupted. How do we know that? If bit was just, you know, mangled, one to zero or something, we don't even know. So let's consider that that case, we downloaded a file, everything was downloaded, just by one bit, it got corrupted. Now, how do we figure that out? And then how do we efficiently fix that part of the file which is uh, corrupted? Now, when we break this file, we actually try to build a root, you know, Merkle tree again. What happens is we break this file into, you know, similar chunks of an equal size. We still get four different chunks in which this is correct, second, three, and four. Definitely the last part of the file which is corrupted will be in the fourth segment or chunk. So when we try to build the same Merkle tree, here the interesting thing is we don't get D as a hash because the content is different. When we give that content to hash function, we won't get D like earlier. We actually get something else. Let's take this hash is Z. So when we repeatedly build the Merkle tree from bottom up approach, we actually get CZ. And here the root hash is actually ABCZ. When the client sends back the root hash, it actually sends back ABCZ. When we match with the existing Merkle tree, we actually get ABCZ not equal to ABCD. That means that the server will definitely know that, okay, whatever we download is corrupted. So we'll have to fix that. And even the client will understand that, or maybe it could, it could have done in the reverse way that the server is giving the root hash value and the client has the root hash value. He compares here itself that, okay, it is corrupted and we'll get to know. So now we need to fix it. How do we fix it? So now, as soon as the client knows that something is corrupted, it requests for the file metadata that is the whole Merkle tree itself. The server can decide to send the whole metadata of Merkle tree, which is very negligible size compared to the file itself. So the client has the whole Merkle tree of the server, which is the legitimate copy. So now what it can do is, now it can actually compare tree by tree or node by node. That's how it actually figures out which part of the file is corrupted. Now, how do we check it? So we check, uh, so consider this, this is downloaded on the client side now. So we keep on checking from the root node, okay? Now we check ABCD and ABCZ. We got to know the file is corrupted. Now we will have to find which chunk is corrupted. We go to the next level, we check here, AB, AB, it's good. That means that everything under this is intact. Everything under is intact, we don't need to really check. Go to the other side of the node, CD and CZ. That means that we know that something here is corrupted. Now we go one more step down, CC, good. DZ, that means that it's not equal. That means that something here is corrupted. If the tree is even bigger, we keep drinking, you know, inspecting down, deep down, and we finally end up to a leaf node, which is actually corrupted, and we know the node, which is also corrupted. And this is considering we only made four pieces, this is like one by fourth of the file is actually corrupted. We can only request one by fourth of the file to the server, and it gives back one by fourth of the file. And then we replace the uh, file with actual content, and we get the complete file, which is not corrupted. If we have more chunks, the more chunks, we actually reduce the, you know, uh, repair bandwidth. So that's a fine balance, okay? So that's how the whole Merkle tree works. Now let's understand different use cases or the different system, how they are actually using Merkle tree 
uh, to solve some of the file corruption problem. So now let's understand how Merkle tree is used in peer-to-peer -peer network or BitTorrents. So if you know how BitTorrent works, usually BitTorrents will have a tracker server and, and of course the peers in the network. Peers are the one usually you can think of as a user. So we have a file to be downloaded via torrent. Then usually every file will be associated with a file called as torrent file, right? Torrent file. So this torrent file actually contains the file name and some meta metadata information. And also it contains the tracker server's um, uh, addresses or IP addresses or whatever it is. And also it contains the whole Merkle hash tree itself. So why do we need Merkle hash tree in the you know, torrent file is because whoever has this torrent file can actually verify whatever download the data downloaded uh, to their computer is um, intact or corrected or not. And so they can re-download and rebuild the whole file until they get the Merkle tree, all the hashes right. So let's see how this works. In in peer-to-peer, -peer, we basically download. So this peer is trying to download this file. In that case, first what we'll do, what he will do is as soon as he joined to the network, he actually talk to the tracker, any one of the tracker which is listed in the torrent file, and then he gets the you know um, all the peers who actually is seeding or um, providing this particular file from their computer. So consider if this guy, uh, this tracker told that peer one, two, three is actually providing this file which you're requesting for. So and their network addresses also. Then what this um, peer four will do is he contacts this, contacts this, and contacts this, and start to download all the uh, content of the file. And even these peers doesn't completely give the entire file to be downloaded. They actually gives in chunks only. Say for example, we break this file again into one, two, three, four chunks. Okay. Now he might be ha everyone will be having every chunks. But from here, he might be downloading only chunk one, from here three, here two and four. Okay, that's how we basically uh, get the chunks or the different chunks of the files. Uh, so if you see BitTorrent, you will actually see all the different chunks downloading in parallel. Um, so once you are actually downloading, you already have the torrent file loaded to your um, you know, BitTorrent. So you already have access to all the hashes in the Merkle tree, which was computed by the initial uploader. So as soon as you receive individual chunks, you can actually keep computing the Merkle tree slowly uh, and in parallel. And as soon as you get all of these chunks, you will actually compute the root hash and check uh, if it is matching with the root hash, which is in the torrent file. So that way you will actually know whatever I have downloaded to my machine is intact or not. There are peculiar interesting cases. Say for example, if this guy is a malicious uh, guy in the network who is trying to uh, spread viruses um, in the name of that file or in that specific chunk of the file instead of actually giving serving the one of the chunk of this file he has replaced that chunk with a virus code or something and when someone is trying to download that file in 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 the place of actual chunk one he might have received virus code or something so how do we uh, validate that so it's again simple when we have the merkle tree hash we know what is the exact hash which was supposed to be computed for that chunk. So we calculate chunk of that uh, specific segment. If he has tampered that uh, actual chunk with something else, that means that we get a different hash. So the root hash will be different when we build the whole tree when, once we receive all the chunk. So we know that this chunk provided by this peer is actually corrupted. So we will, what we will do is we will ignore the chunk which he is providing and we will download from someone else. That way, the whole file is still intact. So that's how Torrent is actually using Merkle tree to fix security problem and also to make sure the files are intact. So the same way we can actually use in a lot of different distributed systems as well. Let's also uh, understand some of the interesting, uh, one more interesting uh, problem, what Cassandra is actually using um, Merkle tree to solve that. Say, so if you know, Cassandra actually is a ring of nodes, right? And every node uh, has its preliminary task uh, or its primary responsibility. And every other node also has a secondary responsibility that it acts as a replica node. Say, for example, if there is, there is a node, one, and 
uh, consider we have set a replication factor to three, that means that we should have a um, copy of a data in three different places. We have a, one copy in the node and we should have another two copies in another two nodes. Let's consider, so these are the replica nodes, R, R, and this is the actual node. So, so once there is something, once there is a data which is written to this node, it means that we will have to slowly replicate the data to this replica node and this replica node. Uh, it, de it also depends on consistency. It also depends on the consistency factor. Somehow, everything which is written into this node is actually replicated to other replica node 2 and replica node 3. Let's say, for example, the network to the replica node 3 is actually broken or for some reason this server was rebooting. That means that it can no longer receive any updates from this node. That means that all the data which is there in here is out of sync. The data which is there supposed to be in sync, this data which is there in this node are supposed to be in sync in the replica node 2 and replica node 3 because of the network broken, uh, broken network or the machine was rebooting or something was happening, it was out of sync. So Cassandra actually what it will do is, do is it actually uses a tool called as anti-entropy repair tool to fix the problems in the outdated replicas. So what it does is that tool basically computes the Merkle tree in the node and also computes Merkle tree in the replica node which was out of sync. So both have the Merkle tree and then they start to compare what data is missing and they only sync the missing data. In this case of uh, Cassandra, the data is, the file is not divided as chunk. The chunks are actually the individual rows in that table. Okay, instead of file chunks, they actually treat every individual row as a chunk. So we'll have a huge Merkle tree. Using that huge Merkle tree which was computed in the node and the replica node, we can actually compare what row is out of date and we can only sync the respective row instead of going, you know, instead of scanning one by one, which takes R of N. In this way, we can actually fix in logarithmic N time. So this is quite interesting. So I think you guys have um, learned a lot of interesting things about Merkle tree. It's actually a simple concept of building hashes if you know trees. Um, I guess you liked it, like this video. Um, so if so, please like and share and subscribe this video. Um, otherwise, please leave a comment. I will try to improvise. Thank you.